on behalf of the Cleveland Clinic and Orthopedic and Rheumatologic Institute, my name is Ambrice Chawla, and today I'll be speaking with all of you about joint pain and arthritis, my perspective as a rheumatologist. For today's talk, I do not have any financial interests or disclosures related to the content of today's presentation. Just a brief outline, uh, I do want to talk briefly about some of the various etiologies of musculoskeletal pain in general, and then really focus on the different types of arthritis, some of the more common types of arthritis, and I'll break that down between non-inflammatory osteoarthritis and some of the rheumatologic inflammatory types of arthritis that we have here in our rheumatology clinic. So when a patient presents to my office and they say, doc, I got arthritis, to me that really means, okay, you have some sort of musculoskeletal pain. Then it becomes um, kind of the question to me as a clinician is, what is the etiology of this musculoskeletal pain? As arthritis, I feel is kind of a catch-all phrase for muscle pain, bone pain, tendon pain, and we need to do a little bit more of a focused exam and history to figure out the exact etiology so we can get the correct treatment algorithm going. So I know this is quite a busy slide, but this is actually what a joint looks like. I want to focus your attention on the bottom left-hand corner where it says within the joint. This is what we call arthritis or the articular surface. You see the ends of two bones, and then you see that kind of gray padding. That's the cartilage. And then there's in between that cartilage, there is a joint space filled with synovial fluid. And the lining of that surface is called the synovium. So when there's a pathology in this area, we call that arthritis. Of course, there are several other etiologies of musculoskeletal pain that can happen around the joint. These are what we call periarticular uh, structures. So the muscle to bone connections like tendons, the bone to bone connections like ligaments. There is the part where the muscle uh, connects to the bone where specifically the tendon inserts into the bone called the anthesis. And there's also fluid filled sacs of fluid that help to lubricate the joint called the bursa. So, we have a lot of patients who have you know, uh, rotator cuff tendonitis or trochanteric bursitis as a cause of their hip pain. We would manage these maybe a little bit differently than rheumatoid arthritis. And then of course, we have a lot of patients who have pain maybe over their forearms or over their neck muscles or over their biceps. And these are what we call non-articular myofascial pain. Uh, of course, patients have referred pain that can happen from maybe compression on the sciatic nerve causing pain on the leg during walking, and that's what we call as referred musculoskeletal pain. Looking closer into the actual joint itself, as I had mentioned, there are a few different structures. The ends of the bone called the subchondral bone, lined by the joint cartilage, and then the lining of that is called the synovium. So as I will touch base on a few different types of arthritis today in my presentation, I want to make it very clear that different types of arthritis affect different parts of a healthy joint, anatomically speaking. So again, just to reiterate, arthritis is differentiated from other types of musculoskeletal pain that can be in structures supporting the joint, like periarticular structures, non-articular areas, and referred pain. The majority of my talk is really going to be focusing on the etiology, the different types of non-inflammatory arthritis and inflammatory arthritis. You know, I think uh, one of the misconceptions that's out there is there's maybe one or two types of arthritis. As a rheumatologist, we know there's actually over 100 types of arthritis. We're obviously not going to go over all over 100 today, but I do want to focus on the most common types of arthritis, and I will begin uh, the presentation focusing on non-inflammatory arthritis, specifically osteoarthritis, and later in the talk, I will focus on some of the types of inflammatory arthritis I see, such as rheumatoid arthritis and psoriatic arthritis. So let's start talking about osteoarthritis, again, non-inflammatory arthritis. Why is it called non-inflammatory arthritis? Is it because the joints can't be swollen? No, it's actually the composition of the joint fluid. So in rheumatology and in orthopedics, we oftentimes do a procedure called a joint aspiration, where we can remove the joint fluid or the synovial fluid and test the composition of that fluid to see how many cells of inflammation are within that fluid. And in conditions like non-inflammatory arthritis, for example, osteoarthritis, we don't see very many white blood cells or cells of inflammation. So pathologically speaking, it is not really uh, thought to stimulate the immune system attacking the joint, okay? Other names for osteoarthritis, if I say the acronym OA today, that stands for osteoarthritis, you probably have heard of wear and tear arthritis or degenerative joint disease. 
This is certainly the most common form of arthritis and it is the leading cause of disability amongst older adults. The osteoarthritis burden in healthcare cannot be overstated. Really, uh, it's a, a significant burden when it comes to healthcare costs and expenditure. Uh, the prevalence of osteoarthritis has really increased, estimated around 21 million in 1995, and estimated to about 67 million Americans by 2030. What I find particularly interesting is that 50% uh, of those with symptomatic osteoarthritis are actually less than 65 years of age. So how do patients with osteoarthritis usually present? A lot of times it's joint pain or it's joint stiffness or it's loss of function of the joint. And this is really the main contributor to functional limitation and disability. In the early stages, osteoarthritis is predominantly uh, presenting with pain that's just activity related. So patients maybe when they're uh, playing their favorite sport or playing tennis or walking up the stairs or bending in a certain position to do their laundry, they notice a worsening knee pain or stiffness in their hips. But in uh, later stages, actually, the pain and the stiffness and the loss of mobility can actually start to take over and become more constant. Some of my patients with pretty advanced osteoarthritis complain of pain that wakes them up in the middle of the night or even when they're standing in a, uh, a kind of still position for even 15 or 20 minutes, their knees start to just really uh, cause a lot of stiffness and pain, something called the gelling phenomenon. So going back to my earlier slide about the, where in the joint is osteoarthritis affecting, it's really a disease of the cartilage. Over time, the cartilage starts to break down and the body starts to basically adapt to the years of biomechanical stress and joint loading that have taken place. And they do this by this term called bone remodeling and significantly forming bone spurs or osteophytes. And some folks come to me in the office with hand osteoarthritis with big bony bumps over their knuckles. And that can certainly happen uh, in osteoarthritis. We think about osteoarthritis affecting some of the weight bearing joints like the back, the hips and the knees and knee osteoarthritis is certainly the most symptomatic joint in osteoarthritis. Uh, some of the risk factors for knee osteoarthritis may include prior knee injury like meniscal tears or folks who uh, have played football and had a lot of significant injuries to the area, uh, advanced body mass index, and increasing age are other risk factors for knee osteoarthritis. So as I mentioned, OA primarily affects weight-bearing joints, the knees, the hips, the spine. When osteoarthritis affects the back, we think a lot of times this phrase as degenerative disc disease. Um, and I wanna also make very important, uh, importantly clear that the symptoms of osteoarthritis and the x-ray findings or radiographic findings do not always correlate with one another. Sometimes, you know, if we were to, if I were to x-ray everybody's knee in this office, we would see a significant amount of osteoarthritis or joint space narrowing. But do all of them have uh, clinically symptomatic knee osteoarthritis? Maybe not. And the same can be said vice versa. So my goal for today's talk is to really uh, certainly go over the evidence. What are the large scale uh, landmark trials suggesting? What is the evidence suggesting? And I certainly will reference the 2019 American College of Rheumatology uh, and Arthritis Foundation guidelines for the management of osteoarthritis, particularly in the hand, the hip, and the knee where formal guidelines have been recommended. So I will first briefly touch on non-pharmacologic uh, options for the management of osteoarthritis, which I believe are currently a little bit underutilized. Uh, and then Dr. Respinto will take over and discuss on some of the uh, cognitive behavioral therapy strategies for managing pain. Um, so I don't wanna steal her thunder too much, but I will touch briefly on the non-pharmacologic options for osteoarthritis before talking about some of the more traditional medications. So we definitely know in the literature and through our years of practicing that weight and body mass index has a very strong correlation with osteoarthritis. The more weight we load over our hips and our knees, actually we see worsening osteoarthritis in a multitude of areas, not only from an x-ray finding, but also from pain scores, also from loss of joint function, also from folks who've had to get their knee replaced. In fact, some patients have a very advanced body mass index where there has been studies that have been shown that maybe a gastric sleeve or a gastric bypass or bariatric surgery has improved osteoarthritis symptoms of the knee. There also has been studies that have supported that pro-inflammatory micromolecules of uh, osteoarthritis are increased in hand osteoarthritis. And it's something I do see a lot clinically. Uh, 
patients with advanced body mass index and obesity and morbid obesity with very significant hand osteoarthritis. I think the third bullet point is something I really want to drive home. The importance of even some weight loss and osteoarthritis can certainly be uh, beneficial and, and, and the vice versa, very detrimental with weight gain. There's a 40% risk of knee osteoarthritis per every 10 pound of weight gain. Another question that I oftentimes get is physical activity in osteoarthritis. Doc, can I still do the activities like I enjoy doing? Is it going to worsen my knee osteoarthritis? Now, there are different types of studies that have really been done from high intensity exercise to moderate to low intensity exercise. Really, there's nothing robust to suggest that increasing physical activity worsens osteoarthritis. In fact, we know from a general health perspective, cardiovascular disease, depression, early mortality, all are significantly reduced with physical activity and cardiovascular exercise, uh, aerobic exercise rather. Um, so certainly the, the risk benefit ratio of the concern about potentiating knee osteoarthritis versus improved cardiovascular outcome certainly strongly favors benefit. Uh, our physical activity recommendations published by our government in 2018 actually recommends a target of about 150 minutes per week of moderate intensity physical activity with folks with osteoarthritis. Uh, and, and I think, you know, modifying your activities, listening to your body is very important. You know, I have a lot of folks who are very active and then over time they start to have symptomatic hip or knee osteoarthritis with stiffness, with pain, with a little bit of swelling. That can happen, particularly after they perform high intensity exercise. And I think it's important to maybe uh, perform activities that may reduce the level of discomfort. So activity modification, elliptical machine, swimming, Tai Chi, I think is extremely important. I'm a big proponent of re recommending aquatic therapy to my patients to ease the biomechanical stress over the joints. I think also physical therapy and occupational therapy are extremely important when it comes down to osteoarthritis management, and they are strongly recommended by the 2019 American College of Rheumatology Treatment Guidelines. It's very important we stretch and strengthen the muscles to help support the joint. Uh, for example, in knee osteoarthritis, there are a number of exercises to strengthen and stretch the quadriceps, the hamstrings. We know that over time, these patients have a better outcome in managing their pain in their weight-bearing joints. I think, um, as Dr. Respinto will touch here shortly on some of the cognitive behavioral approaches for patients with some of the fear of performing some of the activities uh, given their level of pain and discomfort at baseline. This is a study I oftentimes cite with my patients in the office. You know, this was published in the New England Journal of Medicine a couple of years ago, looking at folks with severe knee osteoarthritis. And the double blind of the trial, one group was getting recurrent steroid injections, which I'll touch on here in a minute, versus the other group that was simply doing physical therapy. And actually over a year, they looked at different uh, scores of pain, of discomfort, of joint function, of range of motion, of x-rays. And they did see that patients who underwent physical therapy had less pain and disability at one year compared to those receiving the steroid injection. So it does work. It just may not be an overnight phenomenon. I also want to touch on some of these other modalities to offload the knee bracing. So in, in knee osteoarthritis, the inner aspect or what we call the medial component, a compartment of the knee is significantly affected with osteoarthritis. So there are some offloading knee braces available to uh, take some pressure off of that area. Uh, in folks with pretty significant uh, hip osteoarthritis, we do recommend using a cane on the opposite hand to offload the stress of the uh, hip osteoarthritis. Uh, there are other uh, modalities that are out there that the American College of Rheumatology gives a low level of recommendation for, heating packs, ice, a TENS unit. And then of course, I do think that complementary and integrative therapies should be strongly uh, looked into when it comes to Tai Chi, yoga, meditation. And now I wanna focus on some of the medications that we know how to help manage our osteoarthritis. It's very important, a disclaimer I wanna mention here that in osteoarthritis or wear and tear arthritis, we do not yet in 2022, unfortunately, we do not have a disease modifying drug. Uh, we don't have a medication that's going to stop uh, the progression of osteoarthritis or pump the brakes and stop this process from occurring. I always tell my patients, really, it's like a train that we know it's going to reach its end destination. It's about using the right combination of low risk interventions safely to slow that train's speed from getting from point A to point B. 
I'll talk a little bit later about rheumatoid arthritis. That's a little bit different because we do have medications that can more or less apply breaks and stop that process. But unfortunately with osteoarthritis, we don't have that medication yet. So I will touch a little bit on topical therapies, some of the injections, uh, and some of the medications we take orally by mouth. I think the first thing to do is always start with some of the low risk interventions that are otherwise pretty safe and well tolerated. And a lot of the local therapies like the topicals like Volterran gel or capsaicin cream or uh, Asper cream, they are really good for osteoarthritis of superficial joints, particularly the hand and knee, uh, more so than the hip or shoulder given that those are deeper joints. Uh, so I'm a big fan of Volterran gel. It's diclofenac. It's more or less like a uh, Advil cream. Only 5% of it is systemically absorbed. So I know some people cannot take NSAIDs due to high blood pressure, or they have a history of a gastrointestinal bleed, or they're on a blood thinner, but topical NSAIDs like Volterran gel are pretty safe and, and not much systemic absorption. There also is capsaicin cream which is actually a derivative of the chili pepper. It targets a molecule called substance P, which is part of the peripheral nerve uh, pain uh, pathway. And it does help in that term of analgesia. Uh, the side effects, it certainly being a chili pepper derivative can cause some stinging, some burning, some localized redness. So I always tell my patients, maybe use some gloves when you apply it, remove the gloves, thoroughly wash your hands. You certainly don't want to touch your eyes after uh, using this kind of stuff. Uh, local therapies also include uh, topicals like menthol cream, lidocaine. In theory, they have good data to block some of the sensory nerves, but in clinical practice, uh, they are used, but a lot of my patients report that they don't maybe help the best or they've tried them and then they're coming to see me. I also sometimes recommend paraffin wax bath. It's a, essentially a hot candle wax bath that you, you dip your hands in there and it feels good from an analgesic standpoint. Again, this is not going to modify osteoarthritis or pump the brakes on the progression of osteoarthritis, but we know that these therapy uh, can be helpful and they're quite safe. I now want to touch a little bit about injections. Uh, we are giving different types of injections for some of the larger joints like knees or hips, and there are different types of injections, and I think each type of injection offers uh, pros and cons. Um, I generally inject knees and hands very often in the clinic, even some of the bursa of the hip and the shoulder. Uh, I do think the true hip joint for hip osteoarthritis should be uh, injected via ultrasound guidance. It's a deep joint. There's a lot of blood vessels and nerves in that area, and it should be done under either fluoroscopy or ultrasound where we can see the anatomy. The different types of injections I will be discussing uh, here in the next few minutes will be steroid injections, what we are known as cortisone injections. Uh, there is something called visco supplementation or uh, synvis or hyaluronic acid, and there are some other types of injections that have uh, been making some news lately, okay? Um, so the first type of injection that we know that has been out there for quite some time that the American College of Rheumatology actually still has a recommendation for are the glucocorticoid or steroid injections. I oftentimes mix a little bit of steroid here as you see Kenalog or Triamcinolone with a couple cc's or small amount of lidocaine just to make the injection a little bit more tolerable. Uh, we use a very, very small needle. So I think in in application, uh, the procedure sounds a lot worse than it is. I oftentimes hear from my patients, wow, doc, I didn't even really feel that. So um, I do say that because I met with a lot of anxiety for folks uh, who do not really uh, have an interest to have uh, injection. The, the data about knee osteoarthritis and steroid injections, it, it does support some sort of analgesic benefit. However, that benefit is pretty short-lived, uh, doesn't usually exceed over three to four weeks, or 20, 26 weeks, excuse me. Other uh, information I wanted to provide about cortisone or steroid injections, we usually don't uh, inject more often than every three to four months. There has been some data to suggest that long-term recurrent steroid injections are quite detrimental and they can actually uh, exacerbate cartilage, uh, cartilage breakdown. Um, so we don't have yet a set number of total number of injections that one can get in a lifetime. But when I hear folks who've had their knees inject, injected every three months for the last number of years, I try to be hesitant and explore other options. In my patients who have pretty advanced uh, diabetes or high blood sugar, I do uh, always counsel them that some of the steroid I'm injecting into the joint can be absorbed into the body and we need to watch the blood sugars very closely. The other type of injection we give is hyaluronic acid, uh, which is visco supplementation. These are oftentimes uh, by trade uh, synvisc or orthovisc. Hyaluronic acid is a substance that we all have in our joint fluid 
to lubricate the joint. So it is a synthetic lubricant. It is FDA approved only for knee osteoarthritis. And the thought is that if we inject it into the joint space, can we increase the amount of lubricant within the joint space or can it help to regenerate cartilage? And really the, the studies that have been done, organized and formal uh, literature review and studies that have been done for visco supplementation do not support that this actually does create more space. How, however, on the flip side, I have had patients who have reported some sort of analgesic benefit. So I do think there is a role for visco supplementation. However, I would not certainly turn to it as a first line option for knee osteoarthritis. Again, some of the advantages overall, it's, it's not much of a systemic toxicity. There's not, you know, whatever is absorbed, we don't have to monitor the blood sugars or the blood pressure as we might if we give a steroid injection. And there are really no long-term detrimental effects that have been reported. Uh, but like I said earlier, it's not always effective and it does certainly take some time to kick in. The uh, PRP injections or platelet-rich plasma injections have certainly made a lot of noise in the last few years, just given the paucity of options we have for osteoarthritis, particularly knee osteoarthritis. And again, the idea here is to kind of provide growth factors for our body's cartilage to stimulate some sort of repair. And again, we don't have any large-scale studies to really support PRP injections. Um, some patients are receiving different formulations and not the exact amount of mixtures. So it's really hard to uh, make a generalized statement about PRP. There is a concept called prolotherapy, where sometimes the joints are injected with dextrose or sugar to sort of cause a localized injury to stimulate the immune system's natural response to start the healing process. But again, limited studies have been performed and there's no currently clear benefit to these uh, types of options. Botox has also been studied, but not effective for large scale studies. Uh, oral medications for osteoarthritis. I'm sure several of you on the uh, call today have tried a number of these options, whether it be acetaminophen or different types of NSAIDs. I do want to touch on some of the other options we have, like diloxetine and tramadol, and some of the new supplements that are on the horizon. Acetaminophen, Tylenol. Uh, you know, I, I'm very cognizant that this medication is not the end-all answer for osteoarthritis, and many of my patients have tried it, and it's not helping their pain. But I oftentimes, with my patients and the dialogue I have with them in the office, I oftentimes realize that maybe they're not on the higher dose and they're not taking it as frequently as they can. From an oral medication standpoint, Tylenol is quite safe, uh, certainly safer than the NSAIDs, which I'll talk about here in a moment. Uh, I do recommend arthritis strength Tylenol, 650 milligrams, as long as my patients aren't exceeding 2,500 to 3,000 milligrams in a 24 hour period, I feel that it's relatively safe. Of course, if we have consistent use of high doses of Tylenol, particularly over 3,000 milligrams, there's a concern for liver toxicity. More effective drugs for osteoarthritis include the NSAIDs. When I say NSAIDs, I mean non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. And these are what we call COX inhibitors. The COX is cyclooxygenase. It's an enzyme part of the inflammatory cascade. So ibuprofen, naproxen, Advil, Motrin, Aleve, these are the ones that we see over the counter. But oftentimes we prescribe prescription strength NSAIDs in the office, meloxicam, Celebrex, Diclofenac. These certainly have more side effects systemically compared to Tylenol or acetaminophen. They can increase the risk for irritation of the stomach lining we call gastritis. They can increase the risk for GI bleeds. So I definitely stay away from these kinds of drugs. If a patient has had a history of peptic ulcer disease, they can increase the risk of kidney injury. Again, I stay away from these drugs in my patients who have already some chronic kidney disease. And it's also important to recognize that these drugs cannot be used in patients who are on blood thinners or who maybe have a history of a gastric bypass surgery or inflammatory bowel disease like ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease as NSAIDs in these background conditions can certainly exacerbate overall uh, disease state. I wanna make it very importantly clear that osteoarthritis and musculoskeletal pain in general is managed in a multimodal approach. There are many team players when it comes to osteoarthritis. We all have our own lens. There's orthopedics, there's uh, folks like myself, rheumatologists, there are sports medicine physicians, there are pain management, there's physical therapists, neurologists, podiatrists, so on and so forth. So I do think when we start to explore these other agents for osteoarthritis, we sometimes defer to the expertise of our colleagues, particularly when it comes to opioids. Some patients have very advanced osteoarthritis. They have explored all the options I've already listed and discussed. 
they have done physical therapy, they've done occupational therapy, maybe they're not a candidate for surgery for a joint replacement. So oftentimes opioids are uh, a treatment strategy. From the American College of Rheumatology, there is a conditional recommendation for tramadol as a weak opioid to use in osteoarthritis of the hip and knee. But non-tramadol opioids like oxycodone, morphine, those kinds of medications are not recommended given the adverse effect profile, constipation, confusion, and an increased risk of falls that can be very detrimental. I also want to touch on a medication called duloxetine. By mechanism of action, it's what we call an SNRI, serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor. And this actually is a traditional antidepressant. But over the years of using this drug, we've actually learned that it does target some of the nerve pain. Uh, and it has a recommendation not only for neuropathic or nerve-related pain from conditions like diabetes, but it also has a conditional recommendation from the American College of Rheumatology for osteoarthritis. A very common question I get in the clinic daily are, what are some of the dietary supplements and alternative options we can use for osteoarthritis? Now they have studied some of these things like omega-3 fatty acids and rheumatoid arthritis, which have some positive benefit. But in osteoarthritis, still there is no robust evidence to support vitamin D, glucosamine, chondroitin sulfate, or omega-3 fatty acids for helping symptoms or preventing the progression of osteoarthritis. Um, vitamin D is very important in osteoporosis, which is the weakening of bone. And it's important for maintaining strong bone, especially in women postmenopausal. But it does not have any sort of therapeutic effect in osteoarthritis, at least per what our research has been showing. Uh, glucosamine, chondroitin sulfate, these are glycosaminoglycans, or what we call GAGs. These are part of the normal, healthy cartilage structure and functioning, and keeping this cartilage integrity. But it is very unclear that an ingested tablet of chondroitin sulfate will increase actual joint cartilage. And uh, our funded studies from the NIH have not shown any sort of uh, effectiveness of this compared to placebo. The studies on fish oil have also been a little confusing. If fish oil was thought to be helpful for osteoarthritis, we would expect high doses of fish oil to be even more uh, beneficial. However, the studies have actually shown that low dose fish oil was more beneficial than high dose fish oil. So that kind of uh, makes the whole concept of fish oil being beneficial in question to begin with. The American College of Rheumatology guidelines do not actually formally recommend vitamin D, glucosamine, chondroitin sulfate, or fish oil, omega-3 fatty acids uh, in part of the treatment algorithm for osteoarthritis. Um, I want to certainly touch on CBD oil. It's a very popular question I'm fielding on a daily basis um, for osteoarthritis. Uh, just in general, a little bit of information, CBD oil is extracted from hemp, a variety of cannabis that has only traces, so a very small amount of THC. Uh, really, to be honest with you, most of my patients who have used CBD oil tolerate it quite well. Uh, and even from a uh, large scale um, clinical uh, perspective of seeing patients use CBD oil for a number of years now, there really has not been any major serious safety concerns that have been associated. Uh, and, and CBD oil certainly might help outside of some of the pain, but it might help with some of the anxiety and sleep aspects that can be disturbed from significant uh, pain and osteoarthritis. Again, you know, with regards to opioids, tramadol, and even the radiofrequency ablation procedure, we oftentimes defer to our pain management colleagues. Uh, radiofrequency ablation is what we call the genicular nerve block. It's when the pain management colleagues of ours will help to, um, the easiest way I explain it is to kind of zap the nerve that can be contributing to osteoarthritis pain, particularly around the knee. This is really uh, an option for patients who are more or less unfit or not deemed safe for a joint replacement or who have had failed a joint replacement and they still have symptomatic osteoarthritis pain. So I really hope that during my career, I'm able to see some sort of transformation in osteoarthritis therapies as my colleagues have in rheumatoid arthritis. Um, we are studying a few different types of medications to again, target some of the nerve related pain, inhibition of nerve growth factor, tenazumab, ficinumab. They have been having some positive studies on pain response. However, uh, the studies with concomitant use with NSAIDs, these medications actually showed an increased risk for rapid osteoarthritis progression and causing dead bone or osteonecrosis. So for those reasons, it has not yet been approved by the FDA for osteoarthritis. 
Other drugs are targeting the fibroblast growth factors, the um, biomechanical mechanisms of knee repair and joint repair to try to improve cartilage thickness. But yet at this point, we don't have any clear uh, evidence that these medications are working in a beneficial way. There has been some positive preliminary data about a bisphosphonate, a drug we use in osteoporosis called reclass or zoledronic acid. Uh, there were some studies that were recently published showing bone marrow edema on an MRI as part of osteoarthritis and perhaps this medication reducing that signal in folks treated with reclass or zoledronic acid. So that's something that we will certainly uh, keep our eyes on as we move forward. When all these different medications and, and non-pharmacologic options and interventions with pain management have failed, I think it's reasonable to talk to an orthopod or an orthopedic surgeon about joint replacement, whether it be the hip or the knee. And the indications for joint surgery is really when we have a total loss of function of the joint, severe pain, unresponsive to medical therapy and non-pharmacologic therapy. These are my patients who are waking up at night with severe pain in their hips or severe pain in their knees, who can't stand in one place over 20 minutes from significant pain or who can't even walk one block or can't even do the things on a day-to-day -day basis that help them around the house, like climb stairs or button their shirt or uh, things like that, where it's time to really look at, is there something that can help me pass medication? So my summary slide for osteoarthritis. Uh, unfortunately, our management still remains on symptom and function improvement. From my angle as a clinician, it's using the right combination of medications safely. Unfortunately, we do not yet have a disease modifying drug in osteoarthritis that's going to really alter the structural progression of osteoarthritis. As I mentioned earlier, the train is going to reach its destination at some point. It's about slowing the speed of that train with weight loss, with physical therapy, and the right combination of medications I highlighted. Um, I do think that some of these non-pharmacologic physical modality approaches like occupational therapy, physical therapy, weight loss are certainly the mainstay of treatment, but are currently underutilized. Um, as I mentioned, weight loss and avoiding knee injury is important for knee osteoarthritis. NSAIDs are still the first choice from an oral medication standpoint, and we're certainly looking forward uh, to some of our studies for the novel pharmacologic approaches going forward in the management of osteoarthritis. The second part of my talk now will be uh, dedicated to the types of arthritis that my expertise really uh, is, is, is useful for. It's the inflammatory or autoimmune arthritis. So again, inflammatory arthritis, because if we do a joint aspiration, if we put the needle in the joint space and we remove that uh, synovial fluid and we test the composition of that fluid, we see lots of inflammatory cells or white blood cells. And now we think really the person's uh, the patient's immune system is attacking the synovium or the lining of the joint. In rheumatoid arthritis, this is a very common uh, type of inflammatory or autoimmune arthritis, which is distinct from osteoarthritis. It does affect 1% of the population uh, and females are affected more than men. And typically the women are in their middle age from 40 to 60 and usually men are diagnosed at a little bit of older age. Like all autoimmune conditions, we think that these types of autoimmune diseases happen in folks who may have a genetic predisposition, and then maybe they have some sort of environmental insult. Maybe they had a virus, or maybe they were smoking, or maybe there was another traumatic event that maybe made their immune system a little bit vulnerable and had them express that disease from a phenotypic or physical exam standpoint. I do wanna make a very strong association with smoking with rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, we do look at a couple of antibodies or blood markers in rheumatoid arthritis. One of the antibodies is called CCP, which I'll talk about here in a minute. And smoking uh, has been shown to increase the uh, formation of that antibody. So what is the major modifiable risk factor for rheumatoid arthritis? It's certainly to stop smoking. So how do inflammatory arthritis present compared to osteoarthritis? You know, osteoarthritis, we think as patients with weight-bearing joints, the back, the hip, the knee, worse at the end of the day, tons of stiffness, worsen with activity. Rheumatoid arthritis and types of autoimmune inflammatory arthritis really have a mind of its own. They start causing a lot of symptoms right in the morning when patients wake up. My patients with RA oftentimes wake up, they have big red, warm, puffy, swollen knuckles. They have a difficult time closing their hands. They're really stiff in their wrists or the base of their toes. And it really takes them a while to get moving. In fact, oftentimes I hear patients stating they're kind of stuck in bed for a while, very stiff, even sometimes over an hour. Um, 
a lot of red, warm, puffy, swelling joints, especially the small joints like the wrists, the bottom set of knuckles here, the middle set of knuckles here. And in rheumatoid arthritis, these uh, symptoms are almost always predominantly symmetric and bilateral, meaning affecting both sides. Uh, and oftentimes these patients have what we call flares, a worsening exacerbation of periods of increased inflammation. So on the left is our kind of American College of Rheumatology uh, classification criteria for making a diagnosis in rheumatoid arthritis. Now to even apply that box where you see all these serology and labs and duration, to really even apply this, you have to, as a clinician, see evidence of joint swelling. And now when I say swelling, I mean the knuckles or the wrists. It's not a swelling that's bony and feels like a golf ball or hard. It's a squishy, warm, spongy kind of swelling that really hurts when you press it. It feels kind of hot and warm. And that is what we think of as inflammation. When we see that in conjunction with symmetric bilateral symptoms of small joints, positive markers for rheumatoid arthritis, like CCP antibody I mentioned earlier, or rheumatoid factor, or markers of inflammation in the blood, we try to think maybe this patient may have rheumatoid arthritis. On the right, you see a picture of advanced rheumatoid arthritis and joint deformities. Uh, you know, 30, 40 years ago, when we didn't have these great medications for rheumatoid arthritis, this was very common. We're fortunate now to be practicing in an era of rheumatology where we have so many great pharmacologic options to prevent our patients from uh, having these kinds of joint deformities. So the picture on the left really goes over the pathogenesis of rheumatoid arthritis. Again, it's an autoimmune disease. What does autoimmune mean? Autoimmune means your body's immune system that protects you from infections and, and bacteria and viruses, it actually starts to overactivate and attack the lining of your joints called the synovium. So as you see in the top box, you see a healthy joint with synovial membrane around the cartilage, but then in rheumatoid arthritis, the immune system really is infiltrating the synovium, causing it to be very inflamed and causing localized cartilage destruction. Over time, we do x-rays every few years to monitor for erosions or loss of bone. As I had mentioned earlier in my patients who have rheumatoid arthritis, I'm a big proponent of smoking cessation as it has been shown to improve rheumatoid arthritis symptoms as well as uh, long-term sequelae of joint deformities. Uh, we oftentimes treat the symptoms of some of the flares with NSAIDs and low doses of steroids like prednisone. But we also, at the end of the day, are fortunate to have what we call disease-modifying drugs in rheumatoid arthritis, medications that have been proven to slow the progression down of the inflammation and the formation of these erosions. <clears throat> One of the drugs that we use very frequently in rheumatoid arthritis is a disease-modifying drug called methotrexate. And methotrexate has been around for a very long time, and it has great data in rheumatology, uh, particularly rheumatoid arthritis, in helping to slow down the cartilage and bony erosions, the uh, cardiovascular disease that we can see with rheumatoid arthritis. And of course, when you watch TV, you see all these commercials for some of the biologics, Humira, Enbrel, Zelgans, Rinvoke. These are the, what we call biologics, the highly specialized medications that target different inflammatory micromolecules or cytokines of the immune system to really prevent further joint destruction in rheumatoid arthritis. I think if you're comparing biologics to the drugs above them, what we call the DMARDs, like methotrexate or hydroxychloroquine, the biologics are probably definitely more robust in terms of their strength to calm the immune system down. But in medicine and rheumatology, there's no free lunch. The counter to that is that biologics certainly have a lot more risk for side effects, toxicity, and increased risk of immunosuppression, which in turn leads to more infections. I oftentimes counsel my patients that rheumatoid arthritis, while it says the word arthritis, this is a systemic disease. Again, it's the overactive immune system that is targeting the lining of the joints, but it also targets other parts of the body. It can target the lining of the lungs and cause fluid collections in the lungs. 15% of rheumatoid arthritis patients can have pulmonary fibrosis or interstitial lung disease, which is hardening of the lungs. And they can have lung failure from pulmonary failure. And uh, it can be a very severe disease. Uh, some folks with very severe rheumatoid arthritis can have skin nodules under their elbows. Those nodules can form in the lungs. They can have inflammatory eye disease conditions like episcleritis or scleritis. Uh, we certainly know 
that if there's localized swelling around the wrist, some of the nerves and related structures like the median nerve can be compressed, causing carpal tunnel. But the biggest thing I counsel patients, the biggest risk I counsel on is really the increased risk of cardiovascular disease. This is not just a joint disease. If we have uncontrolled autoimmune attack on the lining of the joints and inflammation, there is robust data to suggest that patients with rheumatoid arthritis will have a, uh, a stroke or a heart attack perhaps 10 years earlier than the average patient who does not have rheumatoid arthritis. So this is my why when I treat my patients for rheumatoid arthritis. It's not that I don't want to help my patients out with joint pain. Of course I do. But I also don't want them to have an early heart attack or early stroke or have an increased risk for lymphoma or infection. Another type of arthritis in the rheumatology world is called psoriatic arthritis. Psoriatic arthritis is different than joint pain with psoriasis. Most patients with psoriasis will have osteoarthritis. As I had mentioned earlier, it's a very common cause of joint pain, the most common cause of joint pain. Psoriatic arthritis is a type of inflammatory autoimmune arthritis. We'd say about one in five or 20% of patients with psoriasis may get psoriatic arthritis at some point. Most times those patients will have skin psoriasis, then start to develop some of the cardinal features of inflammatory arthritis. Red, warm, puffy, swollen joints, uh, morning stiffness, it's very prolonged, difficulty closing the hands. Back in the day, I think we used to think as rheumatologists, well, rheumatoid arthritis is another type of inflammatory arthritis, and it's and perhaps psoriatic arthritis is a cousin disease of rheumatoid arthritis, but we've actually learned over the years that these conditions are quite different. Uh, psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis can do a couple of different things that we don't see in rheumatoid arthritis. For example, the nails can be really affected, which I'll show in the next picture, with pitting or denting of the fingernails. There can be a lot of inflammation around the tendon and what we call sausage, sausage fingers or sausage toes, where the whole finger or the whole toe looks diffusely swollen, a term we call dactylitis in our world. There also can be localized inflammation of the insertion sites of the tendons. The picture on right shows two very common areas, the base of the Achilles tendon inserting into the heel bone, the calcaneus, and the covering of the bottom of the foot causing plantar fasciitis. There also is a risk for axial disease or spinal involvement or sacroiliitis in psoriatic arthritis. And of course, pa patients are at increased risk for uveitis and iritis with eye involvement. And these are some photos I wanted to share about the, the interesting phenotype and physical exam features we can see in psoriatic arthritis. Uh, particularly on the top left, if you notice that patient on the left photo, the, the toe, the second to last toe, the fourth toe is what I'd call a sausage digit or a dactylitic toe. That's a very classic hallmark in psoriatic arthritis. Uh, the picture at the bottom of that, you see some separation of the nail from the nail bed, uh, a term we call on, uh, oncolysis. A uh, uh, picture on the top right is some pitting and denting of the fingernails you see. That's called nail pitting in psoriatic arthritis. Uh, that inflammation of the Achilles tendon on picture B on the bottom right is what we call an enthesitis. And then again, another dactylitic toe there on picture D in the most bottom right, uh, which is again, a sausage toe. Like rheumatoid arthritis, uncontrolled psoriatic arthritis unfortunately does have systemic consequences. Increased risk for cardiovascular disease, increased risk for non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, which can cause cirrhosis, and an increased risk for metabolic syndrome, insulin resistance, type 2 diabetes, high cholesterol, which is obviously plaguing this whole country. Uh, some of the treatment strategies for psoriatic arthritis, you'll see some of the lists of meds here. Yes, some of these drugs we use both in rheumatoid arthritis and psoriatic arthritis. However, the recent guidelines from the American College of Rheumatology and the National Psoriasis Foundation have recommended patients with moderate to severe psoriatic arthritis, we start them on a biologic right away, like Humira or Enbrel as compared to rheumatoid arthritis, where still the gold standard is to start with methotrexate, which is what we call a disease modifying drug and not a biologic. There are other options that we use exclusively in psoriatic arthritis that we do not use in rheumatoid arthritis. Drugs you may have heard of like Stellara, Cosentix, Taltz, Tremphia, and very recently Skyrizi received FDA approval in the management and treatment of psoriatic arthritis. I have to certainly men mention about gout, given that this is the most common cause of inflammatory arthritis, roughly affecting 4% of the population. It does affect men more than women. 
Um, and we know that gout is technically rare in premenopausal female because estrogen helps to decrease uh, uric acid in the blood. So we all have uric acid in our blood. Uric acid is a turnover marker uh, that our cells break down and make. And um, we certainly think that high uric acid can certainly clump together, deposit on the joint and cause a red hot swollen joint. There's a lot of risk factors like body mass index, body weight, chronic kidney disease, uh, and certainly the diet that's high in purines. So these are things like red meat, shellfish, shrimp, beer, uh, all alcohol, particularly beer, high fructose corn syrup, soda, and of course the classic presentation is a, a middle-aged man with a red hot warm swollen big toe that causes excruciating 20 out of 10 pain. And that's typically how a gout flare presents. So we manage gout both from a non-pharmacologic aspect and a pharmacologic aspect. Uh, from a non-pharmacologic aspect, we do think that reducing weight and, and, and uh, staying away from this type two diabetes, chronic kidney disease, metabolic syndrome flavor, uh, and also staying away from foods that are high in purines, like I mentioned, red meat, shellfish, shrimp, alcohol, in the acute flare of gout, we do give medications like prednisone or NSAIDs, like indomethacin or colchicine, but our chronic therapy is aimed at reducing the uric acid in the blood by medications like allopurinol and fibuxostat. I'll finish by briefly mentioning that inflammatory arthritis and joint swelling are not simply rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, and gout. And this is the part here that makes being a rheumatologist very challenging. I have patients very often come to the clinic with symptoms that look exactly like rheumatoid arthritis. They might even have low positive antibodies, but they may have a different condition that explain their inflammatory arthritis. These are other systemic autoimmune rheumatologic conditions that present with joint swelling, again, mimicking conditions like rheumatoid arthritis or gout or psoriatic arthritis. And I'll finish with this slide here, which shows a lot of different pictures but these are some of the conditions that we see in rheumatology. On top left, you see a young woman with this very classic mala rash, a photosensitive rash that happens after sun exposure over the nasal bridge and over the sides of the face. This can be associated with inflammatory joint pain. In the middle picture on top, these are very unfortunate looking uh, skin ulcers that we can see in a condition called dermatomyositis, which is the autoimmune attack against the muscles and the skin. The picture on top right are blood vessel dilatations or telangiectasias we can see in our patients with scleroderma. Again, all these conditions can present with joint swelling. In the middle row, you see that picture of the hand discoloration, something we call Raynaud's phenomenon. Unfortunately, a lot of our conditions are blood vessel disorders or vasculopathies, which can cause uh, symptoms like Raynaud's phenomenon. Unfortunately, on the right picture, you can see a, a very unfortunate appearing CAT scan of the chest looking at very fibrotic lungs. So we do see interstitial lung disease or hardening of the lungs or pulmonary fibrosis in a lot of our conditions. And the bottom left picture, you see what we call palpable purpura of something we see in a condition called vasculitis, which oftentimes unfortunately presents with inflammatory joint disease preceding the rash. And this is what makes uh, being a rheumatologist very challenging as we, we, we wanna be very thorough and methodical in our approach to make sure we get to the underlying etiology. So in summary, I think arthritis is a catch-all phrase for musculoskeletal pain. It's important you see uh, all the team players in the management of musculoskeletal pain, whether it's myself as a rheumatologist, orthopedics, sports medicine, pain management, as we all have our own lens of looking at the etiology. As I think it's important to discern uh, the background disease as this really guides management and improves patient outcomes, both from a symptomatic standpoint and long-term markers as well. These were the references I used in my talk uh, today. And I thank you all for joining. And I was very honored to speak with all of you this afternoon. Thank you so very much, Dr. Chala. What a wonderful presentation. You answered so many of the questions that we had coming in and so many of the questions that we'd received upon registration. So thank you very, very much. We greatly appreciate your time. Dr. Chala is not going to go away anywhere. He's just going to go off camera. And we are going to welcome our next presenter, Dr. Sarah Respinto. Dr. Respinto is a pain psychologist with the Center for Spine Health and Center for Comprehensive Pain Recovery at the Cleveland Clinic. She received her doctorate from the Cleveland State University and completed her postdoctoral fellowship in chronic pain medicine from the Cleveland Clinic.
She offers initial pain psychology evaluations and facilitates several group programs here at the clinic. Dr. Respinto, we want to welcome you uh, for your presentation, which we are very eager to hear. Uh, and that is, yes, your pain is real, and let's change your relationship with it. Welcome, Dr. Respinto. Without further ado, I'm going to let you go ahead and get started. Thank you. Thank you for the warm welcome. And I, it's a pleasure to be here with all of you today. Um, so as um, the warm welcome was introduced, I am Dr. Spinto. I am a pain psychologist. So I work with folks who experience all sorts of different pain complaints. And so I'm excited to tell you a little bit about the work that I do and potentially how it can help you learn to live with your pain a little bit differently. <clears throat> So just to humor me a little bit, if all of you have some paper and pencil handy, I would love for you to, to engage in this exercise with me. So if you don't mind drawing nine dots on your paper, and then I'd like for you after you draw those nine dots to connect all nine dots without lifting your pencil, and you're only allowed to draw four straight lines. Now I know there's the urge to probably make some squiggles or to draw more than four lines or to even draw more than uh, four lines or different straight lines, but Connect all nine dots without lifting your pencil, and you're only allowed to draw four straight lines. And as you're going through this exercise, I really want you to think about some, some different questions. I want you to think about what are you feeling as you're trying to find the answer? What feelings are coming up? What are you thinking? What thoughts are you experiencing about your ability to, to figure out the answer or about other people's ability to figure out the answer? Or perhaps even, am I the only one unable to figure out the answer, right? And then I want you to also notice what you're physiologically experiencing within your body, right? Maybe an increased heart rate or maybe some muscle tension, or maybe you're also kind of getting some muscle tension thinking, well, this is a silly exercise. Why is she having us do this, right? So I really want you to take into consideration what you're feeling emotionally, what you're thinking, and any changes that you're experiencing physiologically in your body. And here's the answer. So we start down here at the bottom right hand. We go all the way up, over and out, down and out, outside the lines, and then back up again. Okay. What I'm really prompting you to do here is to think outside the box. Okay. When it comes to pain, we know your pain is real. And we know it's exactly what you say it is. Dr. Chala just gave a wonderful presentation about all the medical reasons why you may be experiencing pain. But I'm encouraging you to not stop there, okay? Let's think a little bit more outside the box. So let's think about how your thoughts and feelings and your experiences play a role in your overall pain experience. What we know is that our thoughts, our feelings, and our experiences can dial up the volume of your pain, okay? So while your physical pain is real, your emotional experiences, your psychological experiences play a vital role in the way your pain is experienced. Traditional biomedical approaches to treating chronic pain are really insufficient, okay? Yes, they're helpful, they're important, and they're necessary, but when we only focus on those traditional medical approaches, we're doing a disservice to folks because we're not treating the entire picture, okay? And it's a disservice when we only focus on what is causing the pain as opposed to the entire pain experience. And I'll explain a little bit more about what I mean. So traditional approaches to pain treatment really focus on the goal as being the, the finding the source of the pain, trying to eliminate it, block it, use a medication or surgery, right? And there's certainly a role for that, right? But the expectation is that if I have a pain complaint, I'm going to go to the doctor and they're going to fix it. They're going to eliminate it or cure it. The International Association for the Study of Pain actually defines pain as an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience. So while we tend to only treat the sensory component of pain, we're not actively treating the emotional component of pain. And that's where the disservice comes into play. How can we expect folks to get better if we're only focusing on the sensory or the physical experience of pain? Because as pain is defined, it is both a sense, unpleasant sensory and emotional experience. So what we're saying here is that the way we think, feel, and respond to the pain plays a crucial role in the way that pain is experienced. So I had mentioned this biomedical model of pain or these traditional medical approaches to pain. And yes, those are absolutely important and crucial. And that we can kind of focus on that as, the, as uh, addressing the biological components. 
our model that we're emphasizing here is what we call a biopsychosocial approach to managing pain. So yes, our biology um, and biological factors certainly play a role, but also our psychosocial factors play a role. And as you can see here in this image, all three factors really feed into the way pain is experienced and then can contribute to the way we're able to respond to and cope with and process pain. I'm not gonna dive into the biological factors because I think that Dr. Chala did a, a, an excellent job um, summarizing some of those things for us. What I really want to emphasize are the psychosocial factors that play a role. So our psychology plays a role in the way pain is experienced. Um, psychology is part of pain. We all have psychological experience such as depression, fear, anxiety, anger, stress. It's certainly uh, stressful living with pain. Um, our decision-making, the way that we make decisions based on the pain that I'm experiencing today. Um, previous traumas, our thoughts, our beliefs about our ability to cope with the pain and um, work with the pain in, 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 in the future. Um, also our relationships, our social experiences play a significant role. So, you know, how does a family member respond to me when I'm experiencing pain? Do I feel heard? Do I feel validated? Do I, I believe that other people believe me and understand me? Um, and that kind of extends to other relationships that we have as well, whether it's in our work environment, our community, our friendships. Right. So psychosocial factors, which is the summary of all these things. And of course, this this um, list is not exhaustive, um, but our psychosocial factors, such as our emotions and beliefs, can increase or decrease the flow of pain signals in our body. And I'll explain that a little bit more. So how can you change your relationship with pain? We know your pain is real. We know it's exactly what you say it is. And your psychology plays a large role in the way pain is experienced. What's interesting is that physical pain and emotional pain are processed in the exact same part of the brain, okay? So while our physical pain is real and it's exactly what we say it is, we also experience things like stress, anxiety, fear. Am I gonna be able to get through this pain? What's tomorrow gonna look like? How am I gonna go grocery shopping, right? And those thoughts also play a role, right? Our brain doesn't know how to differentiate between the physical pain that we experience and the emotional pain that contributes to it. So I'm not suggesting that our emotions or our psychology causes the pain. What I am suggesting is that there's a relationship between the physical pain that we experience and the emotional um, suffering and pain in our psychological experience that, that, um, that, we, that we have. And that's because physical pain and emotional pain are processed in the exact same part of the brain. A lot of the interventions that we use um, or that I use as a pain psychologist really aim to empower you to change your relationship with pain and rewire the sensitivity of your nervous system. This is not going to cure the pain um, or you know, fix any medical condition that you may be experiencing. But what we aim to do is empower you to change the dial, change the focus, rewire the sensitivity of your nervous system, dial down the volume of your pain and the associated suffering that may be um, connected with that. So your thoughts matter, your feelings matter, and your responses to pain matter. And we have the power to apply various interventions to change our relationship with pain and subsequently rewire your nervous system. This is a common cycle that folks who live with pain often experience. So just for example, let's say in the morning you wake up and your pain is a 10 out of 10. You automatically, without realizing it, have a thought or belief about your ability to cope with the pain or what the day is going to look like. So you may wake up with pain and your automatic thought is, oh no, here we go again. How am I going to get through the day, right? And of course, that's going to lead to an emotional response, frustration, sadness, depression, anger, fear, right? Because you have a lot of things that you want to get done in the day, which then also leads to then a behavioral response. Oftentimes that behavioral response might be, well, I'm just going to stay in bed a little bit longer than, that, than I expected, or I'm going to cancel that lunch date that I had scheduled with my friends. I don't think I can do it, and I don't want to have to sit through that lunch with them in excruciating pain, right? So then what happens is we tend to avoid or become inactive, right? Because we don't, we're, we're fearful, or we don't know if we can effectively get through the day or the activity with this amount of pain. And so we may stay on the recliner a little bit longer than, than we expected, which then, of course, over time leads to 
deconditioning and further functional decline. I'm sure some of you have heard the phrase, if you don't use it, you lose it. Right. And that's kind of a, a very broad way of, of explaining that, you know, if we don't use certain muscles, if we don't use our body the way that it's intended, then we can experience some deconditioning and functional decline, which then leads to a physiological response. OK, increased tension, um, increased breathing rate, um, increased blood pressure. OK, and that also then leads to increased pain. So what we know about pain and stress is that they show up the same way in our body. And so if we can target one area, then we can then subsequently target the other area. I often refer to the pain stress cycle. The more pain we experience, the more stressful, um, the more stressors uh, we experience or the more challenging it is to cope with stressors, even if they're seemingly minor stressors then the more stress we experience, it's certainly going to ramp up the way that pain is experienced in our bodies. So on the right-hand side of the slide, you can see various interventions that I have listed here. So uh, some common interventions that I use is cognitive behavioral therapy, addressing how our thoughts and feelings influence our behaviors and subsequently the pain. Uh, acceptance and commitment therapy. Oftentimes what we do as humans is we want to push pain away. It's bad, I don't like it, and it's it's very unpleasant for me, right? What acceptance and commitment therapy does is it gives us the space to be willing to experience the pain while applying some interventions to help us still lead a values-based life, things that are meaningful, pleasurable, enjoyable for us with the willingness that, okay, I know this pain might kind of be hanging, hanging out with me here. Uh, we use dialectical behavioral therapy. We use mindfulness and meditation. Um, often those terms are used in our, in, um, in our uh, changeably, but they are two different interventions um, with the goal of being present in the moment and finding ways to incorporate some relaxation medicine, some relaxation skills to help calm your nervous system down. We often use psychoeducation, and that can include discussing some of these interventions. Um, it includes activity pacing, self-compassion, which is huge for folks who are living with chronic pain, um, and sleep hygiene. They've done many studies on, on the importance of sleep just for our general health and our general immune functioning. And if we are sleep deprived, even if we don't have any pain complaints, if we're chronically sleep deprived, we're more likely to experience widespread body pain the next day. So you can imagine what sleep deprivation does to folks who are already experiencing a baseline pain. Um, these are all uh, interventions, and certainly this is not an exhaustive list, but these are the types of interventions that we use to help to help empower you learn to rewire your nervous system, to help calm your nervous system down and to address some of those psychosocial factors. So in the Center for Comprehensive Pain Recovery, I just wanna offer some, um, offer all of you some of the interventions or treatment options or programs that we have. So we are a multidisciplinary treatment center, just as Dr. Chala mentioned. Um, there's many team players, right? There's different lenses that we all look through to help address perhaps the similar, a similar um, issue. Um, pain is complex. And so when we're able to address not only the biology, but also the psychological and social factors, we're better able to help you learn to live with your pain more effectively. And so our um, multidisciplinary treatment center involves a pain physician, pain psychiatry, so that they can address both pain and mood. Because like I said earlier, it's processed in the same part of the brain. Pain psychology, which is what I do, um, to help empower folks to learn to incorporate different coping skills and strategies to dial down the volume of the pain, to decrease the flow of those pain signals. Um, we have nursing, social work, and of course, physical therapy and occupational therapy. We have various different treatment options that can be helpful. Um, we have Trek for Success. So this was actually developed by Stanford pain psychology researchers. Um, and we have been certified here at the Cleveland Clinic to offer this to folks. Um, I like to refer to it as a crash course on learning to live with chronic pain. So we dive into some of those things that I had listed before in terms of how to better um, incorporate the relaxation medicine into your daily routine, how to restructure your thoughts or change your relationship with pain, change the way you relate to the pain and the fear, or the anxiety associated with it, um, and how to really incorporate, you know, this meditation or mindful practice throughout the day. Um, we have a pain intensive outpatient program. So it's a four week program. 
Monday through Thursday from 8.30 to noon. And that's where these different multi uh, multi-disciplines um, come into play. So you hang out with us for, for every morning for four days, for four weeks, and we really dive into some of those interventions to help work on thought restructuring, pain acceptance, fear avoidance. These are all key terms that we really try to actively target um, while you're in the program. Um, we also have a back on track program. This is for folks who experience specifically some type of spinal pain or back pain. Um, it incorporates one weekly group with me a week where we, we tackle some of these cognitive behavioral therapy um, interventions, um, but then you also participate in physical therapy. I should mention that the intensive outpatient program incorporates PT and OT um, as well. There's a pelvic pain group. We our pain medicine physician um, offers ketamine infusions. Um, and then we also have the opportunity to explore some individual cognitive behavioral therapy for pain. So what we do as a treatment center is we really want to empower patients to learn to self-manage their pain, more specifically without the reliance on opioids. Um, we can identify and apply various interventions to help the patient change their relationship with pain. Um, oftentimes, when folks are experiencing pain, it feels like that pain is right there. And it's very challenging and distressing to think about anything else or do anything else because the pain can be very severe and debilitating. And a lot of the interventions that we use address those psychosocial factors to help empower the patient to allow the pain to be there. It's, it's going to be there just as Dr. Chala mentioned. Um, you know, it's kind of like the train, right? But how can we apply interventions to help the pain? Okay, it's a lot. It's, it's there. I know it's there but how can I decrease the volume of the pain? How can I change my relationship with pain so it's not stopping me from doing what I enjoy or things that I even have to do? And so we really incorporate positive coping strategies um, to help the patient um, experience improved pain control, improved function, and of course, a better mood. So the key takeaways that, I, that I'm really um, hoping to share with all of you is that we know that your physical pain is real, right? And there, there may be a medical or biological basis to that pain that you experience. We also know that physical pain and emotional pain are processed in the same part of the brain. And so while it's important to address the physical components of pain, it's equally as important to also address the emotional components of pain. Pain is certainly stressful and it can interfere with one's quality of life. And so if we're able to target some of the stress, the anxiety, the sadness, the fear associated with pain or otherwise, we're able to then target the flow of those pain signals. We're able to either dial up the volume of the pain or dial down the volume of the pain. And folks who are able to effectively address these psychosocial factors all the medical treatments and interventions that your doctor will try will actually be more successful because this your, your brain won't be unwittingly working against you and having these unpleasant thoughts about your pain or your ability to work with the pain. And so these psychological interventions, including but not, of course, not limited to relaxation medicine, thought restructuring and self-care and all of these things kind of in combination um, can help you change your relationship with pain and the associated distress that it may cause. I appreciate all of you willing to think outside the box with me. So thank you.